All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. And I'm going to get straight to it. I just finished knocking one down. Hopefully, I'll be able to get that out to you guys tonight. If not by the night, by early morning. This way, those of you that do the commute thing will have something to listen to on your way to work or while you're at work. I'm going to try to knock this second one out and get both of them out. It's all going to be dependent on Sandman and what kind of coffee he drinks. He drinks that old school Sanka. I've been trying to get him on those Folger crystals, but we'll see what happens. Anyways, I've had this story for about a week, but there was a few things that I wanted to vet. I wanted to follow up on a few things. I was able to finally do that today, and the information was accurate. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. Now, this story right here took place in 1998 in Pelican Bay on B Yard. Matter of fact, I was in Pelican Bay when this happened. I was in the shoe program. And there was a lot of shit going on at that time. The Aryan Brotherhood, the, the ABs were up there doing some major house cleaning. They were killing their cellies. I want to say like four or five of them killed their cellies up there within like a two-year period. I remember Rufo came from Folsom. Rufo was an AB member, came from Folsom, slid up into a cell with another AB, and he killed Rufo in the cell. And then in C11, where I was housed, there was another AB member by the name of Deadeye who killed his celly. So, you know, there was some there was a lot of shit going on within the ABs at that time. I want to say Corn Fed was either on his way out or he was already gone. But there was a lot going on at that time. So in 1998, from my understanding, Palomino from Fresno, Fonzie, was overseeing B facility for the Mexican Mafia. You know, I've heard at one time that Dablas was running, you know, a yard in Pelican Bay. And then I heard Tigre from the avenues was running a different part of Pelican Bay. So I don't know, you know, if there was three of them running different yards or, or if they were running different parts of Pelican Bay or if this was just misinformation. I don't know. But at least according to the source that told me this story, Palomino was running that yard in 1998. And one of the things that you guys need to understand about, you know, this story right here is in 1998, the war between the North Daniels and the Suranos was still in full effect. There was no peace treaty or agreement to end hostilities at that time. The war was still on. If there was any talk about, you know, the end of hostilities or a peace treaty, a standstill, anything like that, it was in whispers. It was just, just being talked about at that point in the short corridor but it wasn't in effect yet. So the war was still on. But Palomino apparently implemented a policy regarding the Bulldogs. This policy stipulated that the Bulldogs would be allowed to walk the line on B Yard, but this was the only yard they were allowed to coexist on. So it was understood that the Bulldogs would be allowed to function on B Yard and coexist out there, walk that, that line. But as far as a facility, they were open game and they were going to be rushed like any other North Daniel out there. I don't know what was different about a facility than B facility, but that was the condition and that's what was stipulated. You know, being that Palomino was from Fresno, I'm sure that this was predicated on personal relationships he had out there with different bulldogs that he probably knew from the streets. I'm sure that he, he knew a lot of them from the county jail. He probably, you know, ran into a lot of them out there on the streets, dealt with them out there on the streets. So, you know, common sense tells me that that's probably one of the reasons why he allowed the bulldogs to hit that yard is because of personal relationships that he had forged with bulldogs himself. I could be wrong, but if I am wrong, I mean, explain then why were the Bulldogs allowed to walk that yard? And it just so happened to be from a Mexican Mafia member that's from Fresno. Now, I don't know what type of agreement that the Bulldogs had with the Sureños or the Mexican Mafia at that time. But I remember they had some type of agreement because I remember, I clearly remember seeing Bulldogs that were sold up with Sureños back in the shoe program. There was one in my pod that had sold up with the Sureño and it was something that we were all tripping on. So this was all exasperated by the fact that, you know, they had some type of standing agreement with the Sureños and were selling up with them in different prisons. The initial conflict was over Fresno calling for its own independence and splitting from the North Daniel Collective. Everybody knows that. But this forged agreement that they had with the Sureños only created deeper resentment and solidified the betrayal. So again, Palomino implemented this policy that bulldogs will be allowed 
to coexist out there on B yard. However, it was understood that if any North Daniel pulled up, either they came out of the hole or they drove up on a bus and they landed on B yard, it was understood that the Bulldogs would be the ones to remove those North Daniels. They were the ones to engage, get them off the yard. That was the condition that Palomino had with the Bulldogs. If any North Daniels hit this yard, you guys take them out. Now, for the sake of telling you guys this story, I'm just going to refer to my source as Clever. So I'm not sure how long this policy was in effect, but Clever, from what he told me, at some point, the Bulldogs, they started to get, you know, they started to get tired of, of this policy that Palomino implemented. Now, you know, in, in the beginning, I'm sure they were on board with it. They get to, to, to walk that yard. But at some point, they started to feel played. They started to feel like they were being used by the Mexican mafia. And you guys all know that when it comes to Bulldogs, they don't like being dictated to. Everybody knows that. You know, but as far as these growing resentments that the Bulldogs had with the Mexican mafia and this, this agreement, I'm sure that they weren't interested in forging any peace treaty or standstill with the North Daniels, but more so because they felt like they were being used to do the MS dirty work and it wasn't predicated on their terms. Again, I don't have nothing to go on. This is strictly, you know, this is this is speculation. I'm just I'm 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 giving you guys my theories. But like what else makes sense? If you guys got if you guys know anything different, tell me in the in the comments. So that's what was taking place on B Yard. As far as A facility, A facility was being ran by a Sureño named Shorty from Playboys. Clever said that Shorty was a solid Sureño. He ran a tight program and he basically cleaned up A facility. He cleaned that whole yard up. Matter of fact, Clever described A facility as a victim's yard. I don't know what he meant by that, but he said, you know, A facility before Shorty got there was considered a victim's yard. You know, I'm not quite sure who he meant were the victims or who was being preyed on, but he said prior to Shorty taking control of that, that yard, it was being ran by Alfred Salinas, it from the avenues. So, tabla. so like I told you guys early on, it's not clear who was running what yard or what yard Tablas was running at that time, but apparently Tablas was running a, some part of Pelican Bay or these three, you know, we're doing it together. I'm not sure. That's common, like, you know, a similar situation that, that took place in Salinas Valley, where there was a lot of money that was being generated out there on the yard, and you had several different Mexican mafia members that, that, that had their hands in it. It could be a situation like that. But keep in mind that Tablas and Tigre from the Avenues were sellies at that time. So it kind of makes sense that Tablas... Tigre and Palomino were all three involved. So at some point, Shorty from Playboys, he ends up getting rolled up off the yard, probably because of everything that, you know, he was putting in motion as far as cleaning up that yard, having the trash removed out there, having individuals hit. At some point, somebody either drops a kite on him, administration takes notice that he has a lot of influence out there, but he gets rolled up and he goes to add say. But again, Clever said that once Shorty got the yard up and running the way it was supposed to be, that the administration rolled him up and shipped him out. More than likely either because they determined that he had too much influence or someone dropped a kite on him. So after Shorty gets rolled up, an individual by the name of Benny from Calexico pulls up and he takes the yard over under the direction of Tigre from the avenues. Basically, Tigre tells him to go out there, take control of the yard, and to start reporting directly to him. Now, these two, from my understanding from Clever, these two had a lot of history together. They knew each other from the streets. So Tigre appointed Benny specifically to go out there and run the yard under his authority. So Clever described this guy, Benny, as being a short, stocky guy with salt and pepper hair. And despite the fact that he was older and had been around, Clever said that when it came to politics, he didn't know what he was doing. So after Benny gets there, he starts putting, you know, his 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 mess out together. He starts running the yard under, you know, his his leadership. He starts running around with another individual named Boxer from Claremont. And apparently Clever had done time with Boxer and Calipatria. And when they were there, Clever seen right through the scandalous little game he played. What Boxer used to do is he brown nosed the Yaveros and would try to earn favor with them so that he could stay getting loaded. He knew that the Yaveros obviously had access at all the dope on the yard, so he'd always try to play up to them to get dope. 
So hopefully you guys are following me because you guys remember that initially I started out on B facility. And then I told you guys that A facility was being ran by Shorty from Playboys. So Benny and Boxer, this this is all happening on A facility. So as Benny is out there establishing, you know, the yard under his direction and his leadership, a situation transpires between the Paisas and the Africanos that causes tension between the Sureños and the Paisas. The tension and animosity involved drugs and a transaction with the Africanos, but this was the Paisa's business and didn't involve anyone else. So the Paisa car was being ran by a Paisa that they called Guerrero. And he was the type of Paisa that was 100% pro Paisa. He was down for the Rasa. And that's rare because, you know, in the past, at least my personal interactions with a lot of Paisas, Back in the, the early 90s, a lot of them used to sympathize with the Sureños. Very rarely did you find a paisa that connected with the Norteños or that sympathized with the Norteños. They, there just wasn't no common ground back in those days. A lot of paisas just sympathized with the Sureños. And a lot of the times when something would kick off, the paisas would back the Sureños up. But, you know, Guerrero was the type of paisa that, you know, he didn't agree with all that. He didn't sympathize with the Norteños or the Sureños. So, you know, this situation happens on the yard. Apparently, the Africanos, or supposedly the Africanos, burned the Paisas for a shitload of dough. And the Sureños were mad because Guerrero didn't do nothing about it. He didn't do nothing about it. And if this was true, the responsibility obviously fell on Guerrero, and he was getting a bad look because of it. Anyhow, there was a Sureño named Spunky from West L.A., Helm Street, that had supposedly just hit a grip of dope on the yard for a Mexican mafia member named Danny Boy from Big Hazard. So apparently what happened was, is somehow Spunky is in touch with Danny Boy, Mexican mafia member. Danny Boy tells Spunky to go out on a visit. He gives him directives to go out on a visit. And the visitor is supposed to give Spunky, you know, a, a, a package that's supposed to go back to Danny Boy. Spunky's supposed to go out there in the visiting room, get the package, bring it back on the yard. He's not supposed to give it to nobody. He's not supposed to tell nobody. And then he's supposed to he's supposed to hit somebody on the yard and then make his way back to where Danny Boy is at and deliver it to him. That was the directive that he got. I don't know how word got out that that's what was going on. I don't know how Boxer and Benny found out, but apparently they found out about it. Well, after Spunky comes back from the visit, they were basically trying to get the dough from him. They were trying to mislead Spunky by telling him, hey, just go ahead and give us the dope. You know, we got the, 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 the Yavis out here on the yard. Just give us the dope and we'll make sure that Danny Boy gets it. But Spunky, you know, he's a youngster, but he's not stupid. He's like, nah, man, I got directives. I'm not trying to get caught up. I'm not trying to get crossed up in this shit. You know, I got directives to go back there and to, to hand him this dope myself. And my ass is on the line for it. So Spunky's pushing back, but these guys are dead set on getting the dope from him. Matter of fact, they go up in the cell and they physically sit there and make him pull it out his ass. I'm not trying to be graphic, but this is what you know my source told me. He's like, they went in the cell and actually sat there and made this youngster sit on the toilet and pull it out. And then they, they they took control of the dope and they did whatever they did with it. You know, Boxer obviously had ulterior motives as he wanted to get that dope for himself and he wanted to get high. I don't think he had any intentions on giving that dope or, or somehow sending that dope back to Danny Boy. Either he was crazy or he felt like he could get away with it and they were trying to pull some scandalous shit and have it come fall back on Spunky. But the reason they said that they were trying to get it is because Spunky had agreed to bring it in and then go on a pegada, a hit, and bring it back to the shoe to deliver it. But Boxer was trying to lead Spunky into believing that they had a direct route to get it back there to Danny Boy and that this wouldn't require anyone getting hit. But like I said, at the end of the day, they end up going over to Spunky's cell. They pull a pressure move on him. Boxer is part of the leadership. They direct him to hand the dope over and you know, Spunky, he ultimately, he gives it up. And just as Spunky has suspected, Boxer and, 
you know, his crew, a couple other Serenos out there, they had no intentions on getting that dope back to Danny Boy. They started getting loaded from the minute that they got to their building, they busted it open, got their outfits out, and they started shooting his dope. You know, these guys are probably crazy. Seriously. This is an active Mexican mafia member that's in the shoe program. And, you know, for them to do something reckless like that, either they didn't care about their careers or they just thought they had a way to get up out of something like that. You know, being a Danny boy was was in the shoe that maybe they thought his reach wasn't that far. I don't know. But that was a you know, that was a reckless move on their part, at least on boxers. So at some point, Danny boy, he hears he hears about what happened. He hears that, you know, there's some Sureños out there on the yard that basically pressured Spunky into giving up that dope. They're out there using his dope. They don't have no intentions on sending it back there to him. They got a line to the shoe, but nobody's reaching out to him. So, you know, at that point, understandably so, Danny Boy blows a fuse. He's living. He's like, man, there's some motherfuckers that are crazy enough out there to just straight take my dope like that. So obviously he opens up an investigation. He opens up an investigation. He wants to know who was involved, everybody that touched the dope, everybody that knew about it, and they're all targets now. Either way, Danny Boy's out for blood, and he's still trying to get over the fact that there's, you know, there's there's Sureños out there that are crazy enough, that are foolish enough to steal dope from the Mexican mafia. So what Danny Boy does is he sends two shooters out to the yard, and they have specific directives. Their directives are to go out to the yard, not to give nobody a heads up, not to report to nobody, not to tell anybody what they're doing. They're to go out there, they're to get a piece, fashion a weapon, put a point on it, and they have a list of individuals that they're supposed to whack. So they go out there with on a mission. Clever said that he believes that one of the individuals that was sent out there, his name was Weddle. He doesn't know the second individual, but he was a tall a tall, light-skinned guy named Weddle. So these two guys, they come out to the yard and they execute their plan exactly how they were supposed to. They didn't tell anyone what was happening, including the Yaveros. They knew what needed to be done and that's all that mattered. I'm sure these guys didn't mention this to anyone out of concern for their own status. Unless you're specifically instructed to do so, you're not to report to anyone. You're supposed to go out there and make a beeline and do what, you were, what you're told to do. Because a lot of the times what will happen is if you get out the, the hole and, you know, you go and report to the Yaveros or whoever has the keys out there, a lot of the times somebody might try to step up and, and, and shortstop, you know, that, that hit. They, they might try to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and take responsibility for this. I'm going to tell you right now to stand down. It's not going to happen. We got some information that they don't know about. And, you know, that that's a bad hit. So I'm going to go ahead and take responsibility for it. Don't worry about it. It's going to fall back on me. But that's not always the case. So it's actually better for you not to go out there and report something like that. Because, you know, you might go out there to the yard and you report something like this to the Yavero, the individual that, that, that has the yard. They shortstop it. Let's just say three or four months later, you end up paroling or you get shipped out to another prison. But you don't know what happened from the time that that directive was given. You don't know if this individual actually did reach out and communicate with whoever called that hit. You don't know if, if he stepped up and took responsibility for it or not. So here you are four months later in another prison and all of a sudden you end up getting whacked because they say that you failed to handle your business over there in Pelican Bay or you failed to you know, honor the directives from a Mexican mafia member, Danny Boy from Big Hazard. It's gonna end up being a big mess that you're gonna have to clear up. Otherwise, something like this can follow you to different prisons. I've seen situations where somebody was sent out from the hole with standing orders to whack someone, but when they hit the yard, instead of just making it, making a beeline to their target and getting it done, they advise leadership who then tells them to stand down. You know, the only way that you're going to clean something up like that is if you know for a fact that this individual reached out to Danny Boy and Danny Boy sent something back and you put your eyes on that kite and you see for yourself that they got it worked out between those two or this individual took accountability for it and you're no longer on the hook.
you know, a situation like that where you're sure that, you know, you covered your ass, then you'd be all right. So, again, these guys don't say nothing when they hit the yard. They know what, they, what they're supposed to do, and the first order of business for them is trying to secure a weapon. They're out there on the yard. They're looking for a weapon, but even this is a risky thing because, you know, if you're out there on the yard, you just you just came out of the hole or you just came out of the shoe program, you just hit the yard, and now you're out there. You don't have no resources, so you start asking other Sureños or let's just say other Norteños. Same situation. It's going to be the same result. You're out there and you're asking, you know, I need some weapon stock. I, I you know, I need to, I need a, a, a piece. You know, that's going to raise red flags. People are going to wonder, like, what the fuck is this dude up to? Is he going to, you know, is this dude a, a threat to the security? You know, is, is he a threat to the yard? What are they doing? Why are they asking for a piece? This is uncharacteristic. They're up to something. But these guys, they've been around. Obviously, they know that. So they don't make the mistake of asking other Sureños to help them get a piece or, if, you know, they got weapon stock. They just kind of fall back. So these guys play it safe and they keep it under tight wraps. They didn't have a way of getting any good weapon stock, being that they were new out there and had just landed on the yard. However, they came to find out that if they went to optical, that they could possibly score a box cutter. So that's what they did. They made their way to optical and they came up on a box cutter. And I'm not talking about a tomahawk, a little small, loose razor burnt into a toothbrush or nothing like that. I'm talking about a righteous box cutter. So once they get the box cutter, it's go time. They've been on the yard like two days. They don't really want to waste any more time. You know, Danny boy is expecting this to happen. So as soon as they get their box cutter, they go out to the yard and they look for their targets. Unfortunately for Benny, Benny ended up being one of the main targets because Benny had the keys to that yard. And the way that Danny boy is looking at it is nothing happens on that yard without Benny knowing about it. At least any good leader out there would be on top of things like this, something like this, where somebody out there on the yard took a Mexican mafia members dope. <laughs> you would think that they would know about this situation. So Danny boy assumed that Benny did know. So these two guys, they got their box cutter. So they go out to the yard and there's an area out there on the yard where the Sureños work out. There's like some, some bars, they do bar work, they do their dips, they do their push-ups. They're, they're over there and they're working out. Benny's posted up over there in that area. Boxer's over there. And then there's some other individuals that are part of Benny's leadership. So these guys make a beeline. They go straight over there to where Benny's at. Boxer's also obviously a target because he's the one that took the dope. But Benny is the one that, that's running the yard. So he's the main target. And then again, Spunky, you know, you got to assume that he reached out himself. He probably reached out to Danny Boy and told him everybody that was involved. So they probably just thought that Benny and Boxer were in cahoots. So these two individuals, they go over there to where, where all the Sureños are working out. And, you know, Benny's standing right there. They walk over there. They start shaking everybody's hands. They turn, they look at Benny, and then they go in on him. And even though I'm sure there was none of this, I'm going to give it to you guys anyway, because this is just part of how I do it. No, but on the real, they go in on Benny and they slice this cat up. They, get, they slice them up bad. The one that has the box cutter, I'm not sure if they had two box cutters or if they just had one box cutter, but one of them supposedly slid up behind Benny and he gave him a Colombian bow tie. He gave him one of those Kool-Aid smiles from ear to ear, cut his throat. Benny, he's in shock. He don't know what's going on. There's other Sureños that are part of his leadership, but they stand down. They sense that something else is going on. Something else is in play here. So they don't rush these two cats. These two cats are going in on Benny. And Benny's trying to fight back, but he's also trying to get up out the way. The more he fights back, the more they're hitting him with this box cutter. You know, by the time it was over, Benny had lost a lot of blood. You know, you guys see what those razors can do to you. Imagine what a box cutter, like a righteous box cutter can do to you. I know what they what they do. I used to I used to use them myself out there on the streets and they're nasty. I'd rather get stabbed than to get hit with a box cutter. But anyways, you know, they hit them. 
They hit Benny. The yard goes down. And, you know, those two cats, they did what they were supposed to do. So that part of it is over. So after they got the yard down, they got everybody proned out. You know, they get Benny. They run him to the infirmary. He's got, you know, they, they hit him in the head. They hit him in the arm, in the back. They cut his throat. He's got that Colombian bow tie. So, you know, they, after they stitch him up, they take him to the infirmary. They stitch him up. They take him to ADSEG. When they take him to ADSEG, they put him in A1 section B. And they, there's a, a an area in that ADSEG where they're basically behind glass. This building is designed like bedrock in Corcoran. Those of you that have been to, to Corcoran, it's designed like bedrock. You got a bed on each side of the cell. They don't got bunk beds, one on top of the other. They're side by side. So this is the first time that Clever gets a chance to interact with Benny. And Clever said that when Benny came in, he had one of those white styrofoam things around his neck, something that they put all the way around his neck, probably to hold you know, the bandages in place and to cover up his wound. But he said he came walking in with this big thing around his neck and then they put him in the cell. And, you know, when they, when they would run showers for the next couple of days, Benny would never turn his light on because Clever said that, you know, he wanted to see what Benny looked like. He wanted to see his injuries because he could see him from a distance, but he said that Benny would stay in his cell and keep his light off almost as if he didn't want anybody to see what he looked like. Like he was probably embarrassed, you know, having all those those staples or all those stitches all over him. Whenever he would come out to the shower, he'd only come out if he could go down to the bottom shower. So he didn't want to walk around, walk upstairs and, you know, let other people see what he looked like. So at some point, Clever, he says that he was like, man, I was dying to see what this fool looked like. I wanted to see what he looked like. And it was obvious that he kept on hiding. He didn't want nobody to see what he looked like. So when Clever came out, he said it was eating him up so bad that he ran down to Benny's cell right in front where the glass was at. And that's the first time he seen him. He said his neck looked like raw hamburger meat. There was a thick line all the way around the wound and it was swollen. He said it looked bad. In his words, he said he never seen someone get hit like that. So from the way he described it, it was like a big, thick piece of, of hamburger meat that was, it was probably just scar tissue. But for whatever reason, it had swollen up. It's like he had a big, almost like he had a, a, a hot dog wrapped around his neck or something. That's the way he described it. So meanwhile, while all this is happening, they start rolling up a bunch of people who they felt might have been associated with the hit on Benny. Boxer just so happened to be one of them. But when Tigre gets wind of what happened and that Benny was the one who got hit, he was furious. This was Tigre's boy. Remember, they had a lot of history together. They knew each other from, from out there in the streets. And Tigre is the one that appointed Benny to, to run that yard under his authority. This just goes to show you how wires can get crossed up. You got one Mexican mafia member that's out there, you know, pushing buttons and making things happen. And then you got another Mexican mafia that's supposed to be running this yard. And, you know, the guy that he has out there to run the yard ends up getting whacked. So Clever said about four months later, he ended up selling up with Benny. They ended up becoming sellies. And then Clever said that he remembers one time they were having a conversation and that Benny had told him, he's like, yeah, you know what? When all this shit gets cleared up, one day I'm just going to end up becoming a senor. And just remember what I said, et cetera, et cetera. Clever said, he tells Benny, he's like, dude, you just got hit with a box cutter. You think they're going to pull you after, after they hit you? And Benny was really under the impression that this was all going to get cleaned up and that everything was going to be okay. He really believed that. So all these guys start rolling in from A yard and B yard. There's other incidents that are happening out there on 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 B yard as well. So all these new guys start coming into the hole and then an individual named Diablo from 18th street, he pulls up. Clever said that Diablo was one of those youngsters that he was just a rider. He was somebody that was trying to make a name for himself. You know, any hits that needed to be done, he wanted to do everything. But Clever said later that he got word that Danny boy sent word to the hole to have Benny get hit again. Apparently, Danny Boy was so mad at Benny that he sent a directive out there telling him to hit him. What the fuck is that dude programming with actor Sureños? He said to have him hit and that, you know, he didn't want 
Benny to ever walk another main line ever again. So Danny Boy, he obviously took this very personal. But he sends directive over there to have Benny whacked again. And Benny's going out to the yard with active Sorenos. He really believes that this is going to get cleaned up. So he's out there on the yard. You know, he's 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 functioning with active Sorenos. And then this this another directive comes. So obviously, so after Danny Boy sends these directives over there to the Sorenos that are in ad say, you know, Benny's out there on the yard and apparently he's getting his hair cut. And I'm not sure you know, exactly how it was set up clever. He explained that, you know, when, when you're getting the haircut in there, that somebody else is obviously giving you a pelon. You're not going to get no stylish haircut. They're not going to give you no fade or no, you know, mullet or none of that stuff. You're just going to get a number one. That's basically all they're going to do. But there's somebody else that does it, that gives you a haircut. I don't know if they have a barber come in or if it's just another Sureno that's on the yard. But anyway, Benny's getting his hair cut and he's bent over getting his hair cut by another Sureño. And as this guy is cutting his hair, apparently what he does is he takes the head of the clippers off somehow and he uses a jagged edge of either, you know, the clippers or that, that metal piece that he took off. And he starts going to town on Benny. He starts cutting his head, starts slicing him up again. This dude got bad luck. You know, he just healed up. He probably had like 150, 200 stitches or staples. And now you got somebody else going in on him again. So after Benny gets sliced up, they put him on walk alone. They put him on the walk alone. He stays there for a few months before they end up shipping him out. But, you know, after that situation happened with Benny, Boxer's still there. So he's next on the list. Boxer's out there on the yard. And I told you guys, he's supposed to be some big dude. He's, he's a big guy, supposed to be yoked up. You know, he's got a couple of fools out there on the yard that feel like, hey, this cat, he might fight back, so we might need to send two or three cats on this dude, make sure that we take him down. They're, they're scared of him because he's a big guy. But when, you know, they send whoever that they sent on Boxer, again, they use the Clippers, a jagged. I'm surprised that this was allowed to even happen because you would think that, after somebody just got sliced up with the Clippers, that the administration over there would probably take the Clippers and wouldn't let them, them guys use the Clippers again. That's usually what happens. Somebody fucks something off. Somebody fucks the camera off and they stop. They take the camera away from us. Somebody fucks the Clippers off. They end up taking the Clippers away. So it's just crazy that they allowed them to keep the Clippers out there. But they take the Clippers again. I guarantee you they did after the second time. And they go in on Boxer, but when they go in on him, he runs. He takes off. <laughs> he takes off running, and there's like a bunch of Sorenos out there on the yard that are that are fucking busting up, laughing because this dude is running. But not only is he running, he's making noises again like a laughing hyena. You know, like he's like they're hurting him or something. Clever said it was funny as shit. It was one of the funniest things that you know some of them cats had ever seen. You know, I guess he ran into somebody that was there later on and they they broke the whole incident down to him exactly how it happened. And this guy was like, man, this dude was just a big old pussy, man. He took off running as soon as they went in on him. He didn't even try to fight back. Then he balled up. So anyway, here's the cold part about this story. Benny, he does around six years in the shoe. He does all this time in the shoe program, pulls all his shoe time, and then he ends up getting kicked out to the yard again in Pelican Bay. He does all this shoot time and apparently in his mind, he still seems to think that he can clean this situation up because, I mean, he probably really did think that he could clean it up because he didn't have nothing to do with Boxer taking that dough from Spunky. But in his mind, you know, he's thinking like, man, I really didn't have nothing to do with it. I could clean it up, but he got blamed for it. They, you know, I'm sure Danny Boy thought, you know, this this dude had to be in cahoots with him. So, you know, they're they're both no good. So it wasn't something that he could clean up. So I'm sure after all that time, he's out there on B Yard. He's happy to be back out there with his people again. And, you know, he's just ready to put all that behind him. He done all his shoot time. And, you know, he's out there, he's programming. And then there's a Sureño from Northside Indio. Clever said he didn't remember what his name was, what they called him or anything like that. But 
you know, Benny's out there on the yard, and then here comes this this individual with directives to hit Benny again. So he whacks Benny for the third time. He whacks Benny, and and this hit right here from what Clever, you know, the way Clever described it, it was another bad hit. This time it wasn't no box cutter. It wasn't part of no clippers. This this time it was a flat, and this cat went to town on Benny. So, you know, he almost died the third time, according to what Clever told me. So, you know, at that point, I'm sure Benny realized that he had no recourse that his career was over and I don't think he had it in him to trust, you know, to put that kind of trust in them anymore, in the Sureños anymore. Not after being whacked with a box cutter, then getting sliced up with, you know, the hair clippers and then getting plugged with a bone crusher. I'm sure he was like, you know what, fuck that. I'm done. And Benny finally checked in. You know, obviously, Danny Boy made it very clear that Benny was never going to be allowed to walk a main line again, and he meant it. The last thing you want to do is disrespect a Mexican Mafia member. But definitely the one thing that you don't want to do is take their fucking dope. That right there is the worst thing that you could ever do. So the last that Clever heard anything about Benny, Benny was, was on the S&Y yard. You thought he heard something about him being over there in Mill Creek, but that he was out there on the S and Y, and you know he was programming. And I guess Tigre from the avenues didn't have you know enough influence to help Benny, because he ended up finding himself in a similar situation where he was in trouble himself. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story. I got a bunch more for you guys lined up. You know we're gonna get back to doing what we've been doing. We're going to start doing lives again. We're going to finish up the books. And then we got some other things planned. Also, just to give you guys a heads up, we're still going to be giving away gift cards for Thanksgiving. And then we're going to do it again for Christmas. So we'll go ahead and put something out sometime within the next week or two to let you guys know how you can put your name in that raffle. Again, we're going to spin the wheel and we're going to let the wheel deal with it. We're not going to just select viewers like i said initially we were going to do we're going to let the wheel deal with it this way we're out of it and whoever wins wins anyways with that being said i'm going to try to get both of these stories out to you guys tonight i'll try to drop an inner demons tomorrow night you guys be safe stay positive this your boy b and i'm out <laughs>